beautiful day in November of 2013, my wife and I entered a hospital in Oakland, California, where we live. And even though we had visited the birthing center in advance, we were somehow still startled to find ourselves in a room like this one. Like this one. Oh, watch this. Okay. Terrific. Let me start that over again here. I don't have the right ears, apparently. So we were somehow still startled to find ourselves in a room like this one. There was no hint of the bright and sunny day that we had left when we had entered just a few minutes earlier. It was void of any natural light. Fluorescent lights buzzed overhead, and machines beeped inexplicably as a wall clock indicated day turning to night. That wall clock made an impact on us because it was directly in my wife's line of sight as she lay on the bed in her contractions hour after hour. <laughs> now, obviously, I've never given birth, but my wife assures me that the last thing that a birthing woman would ever want to see are the seconds tick by. <laughs> and so, as we're in this hospital room, we're kind of trying to distract ourselves, of course, and we end up talking about design. My wife's a journalist. She's not prone to talking about design unless prompted by her designer husband. Um, but she and I started talking about this, and one of the nurses overheard. And she said, I always think to myself, I wish I had become an architect because I could have designed a better room. And I turned to her, and I said, you know what? I am an architect, and architects did design this room. <laughs> I actually think that what was needed were not you know, more architects working on that room. It was the insights of nurses like her, patients like my wife, doctors and midwives and others that helped us in our delivery process. And just to be clear, we were well cared for by the hospital staff. But that hospital room sent us messages and I believe that all design sends all of us messages about how to feel and what to expect. There were three messages that we were left with that kind of stick with us to this day about that hospital room. The first was, you are in a foreign place. You are not at home. The second was, you are in control of nothing, not even the lighting. And the third was that your comfort is secondary at best. And this was a momentous occasion for us. We were welcoming a human being, our daughter, into the world. And if we cannot expect good design in that circumstance, when can any of us reasonably expect good design? I'm interested in places like this hospital room. I'm interested in post offices. I'm interested in bus stations, places where everyday people are directly impacted by design for better or worse. And so that hospital has had a major impact on my thinking about the type of design that I advocate for. In another moment of trying to distract my wife, we found ourselves literally wanting for a hospital that we had visited in rural Rwanda earlier that same year. It's a beautiful hospital perched on a hilltop that was once a contested site during the country's civil war, the genocide. And this hospital had so many of the things that the hospital room that we were in on the other side of the world did not have. It had things like natural light filling the wards. Every single hospital bed faced out a window, looking out either into this beautiful courtyard or to the landscape around the hospital. All of the corridors were naturally lit and naturally ventilated as well. They were working under major constraints until just a few months earlier before this hospital was completed. There was no electricity to this particular site. And so they had to rely on natural ventilation. And you compare that to the hospitals that many of us enter into, which are these like sealed chambers in the name of, you know, being sterile or clean or safe. And yet there's no natural light. There's no natural airflow. 
and there are actually a lot of hospital-borne diseases at this point right here in the United States. And so that, this is another thing I think we can learn from the quote-unquote global south. And then the final piece as we walked around this beautiful hospital in Rwanda was that all of the walls were made of this tightly knit volcanic rock, the kind of rock that would normally have been thrown away as one was clearing the job site. These masons, the majority of them women, chiseled each one of these rocks to fit this beautiful wall that wraps around the hospital. And so in addition to creating a dignifying space, this project created livelihoods. It really dignified people's lives. And now these women masons are some of the most sought after in the region. And it's interesting, this hospital, which I truly believe changed the landscape of design generally, not just public interest design or social impact design or some of the other qualifiers that we've historically put on it. I believe it changed our expectations for design and I hope it changes yours. So I've thought a lot about design's ability to dignify. It's, it's the ability to make people feel safe and cared for and comfortable and respected. It's the kind of thing that I see in this photo from the Butaro Hospital of these women who are in one of the poorer countries on earth. But you can see them with their chests held high. There is a point of pride and I really believe it is because they are receiving extraordinary care in an extraordinary place. So I decided to test this idea that design and dignity have a unique relationship. And I ended up writing this book that I simply wanted to read. I started it from the basis that buildings are about people and that people are about stories. And I, I emphasize that because so much of what we read about in design magazines are designers' insights and intentions. And that is great. But that is less than half the story. The other half of the story are the insights of the clients or the impact on the users. And yet those two groups are usually afforded little more than a token quote, at least in the design publications that I read. So I set about interviewing upwards of 100 people from all walks of life about their experience of design. And I never named dignity as a piece of it, but that is exactly what I heard from every single person that I interviewed. And I'd love to introduce you to just a few of them. So in the shadow of downtown Dallas and its gleaming skyscrapers is this humble, beautifully designed cottage community for the 50 most chronically homeless people in Dallas. It was designed for them. To be chronically homeless typically means that you have been on the street for upwards of six months. In some cases, in the case of Gregory Filan, one of the residents I interviewed, he had been on the street for 30 years. Most of us in this room, unless you've experienced homelessness, probably couldn't survive a night on the street so to imagine somebody spending half of their life drifting from town to town, sleeping behind dumpsters, occasionally sneaking into the cab of a truck to sleep, it's something that is incredibly hard for me to imagine. And so when I asked Gregory about his home, he started talking to me about his key. And I thought, I'll just let him go with this. And he talked about having that key in his hand, pulling it from his pocket, slipping it into the lock, and his door, opening that door, and then, most significantly, being able to close that door and lock that door behind him. That sense of security was something that he didn't have for 30 years of his life, and he now feels in an otherwise modest 400-square-foot cottage. When Gregory walked into the cottages at Hickory Crossing, as they're called, he had little more than the clothes on his back, and what greeted him were things like a toaster and a crock pot, a stove, a toothbrush and toothpaste. And he talked about what that meant. It means a lot to me just repeating that. And I obviously have the luxury of telling his story. But just imagine how that place every day must make him feel. This is the inside of his, again, modest home. But it is his home. It is his home permanently. 
And it was made possible by a coalition of designers, the lead of them being Building Community Workshop in Dallas, a nonprofit, a range of foundations, a range of social service agencies, and the city that had actually been investing far more money in keeping people on the street than what was required to build this permanent supportive housing. Gregory simply describes this place to me as heaven. I want to take you around the world again, just coincidentally, back to Rwanda, this beautiful country. This is a community center that was designed and built for and with women who now occupy it every single day. It was the brainchild of an organization called Women for Women International that work with people in other conflict-prone or conflict-inflicted areas of the world. And in this case, some 20 years on, women are still recovering from the scars of war, the scars of that genocide. And so they approached an architect and they worked with that architect and they said, we want our women directly involved with every aspect of this design and construction to the point that each one of the 500,000 bricks that makes up the 17 classroom pavilions like this were pressed by women from local soil. And these are beautiful structures. At night, they're aglow like lanterns. And yet, they're also designed for these women to be in community. I talked with Antoinette, who is the director, a Rwandan woman who is the director of this Women's Opportunity Center. And she talked about how this is a second home for these women. In some cases, it's the first safe home that they feel like they've ever had. They're learning new skills, they're in community, and they're rebuilding their lives. She said to me simply, everyone is so proud of it. And so, at the risk of romanticizing work that's done around the world, I'll come back here to the U.S. one last time. This is a project designed by Marlon Blackwell Architects, one of the premier design firms of our time in Arkansas. It is one of 100 free health clinics that provide care to thousands of uninsured people in the state of Arkansas. They literally have 70 volunteer doctors, nurses, dentists, other very high-end specialists taking care of 3,000 patients annually. And all of it is done free of charge. Their old space was one that you might imagine if you closed your eyes and thought about a free clinic. What would that look like? Well, it sure wouldn't look like this with these beautiful materials, beautiful furniture filled with light. The director, who is a German woman that came to the U.S. and was in the kind of corporate world but went on to become the director of this free health clinic, said that she had never understood that light was so critical to even her own happiness. And now to see that when doctors and nurses and other professional volunteers who are coming to this space, the first thing that they say to her is, this is nicer than any office that I've ever worked in. And Monica says to me, it makes me so proud that not only are these people working in this space, but that our patients have the experience of the space as well. On the inside, once you're past the reception area, it may look a little bit like a normal office, a dentist's office, but still, here again, there is a view out a window that this patient in the dental unit you know, is able to look out. And so this space was designed specifically for this organization and for these patients. And it's beautiful, and it's in we'll say a part of the country that you might not expect to have prioritized this type of care for this demographic of people. So there's a famous Winston Churchill quote that many of you have probably heard. It was, it was um, born in the 1940s as London was debating whether to rebuild its parliamentary chambers after the war. It says, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. And that is why I care so much about architecture and design. That's why I went into architecture and design, and that's why I know many other people in this audience did as well. And yet, 
I believe that the way that we've been educated about who benefits from design, who it serves, who receives its awards, is a warped view of professional responsibility and success. And that troubles me when I interact with students who are plied with the fancy photos that we all know and love in design magazines. They're not hearing about the actual impact of those projects, as amazing as they may be. The majority of people don't benefit from those particular types of projects. And I have a belief that architecture is not just for special occasions. It's something that we all should benefit from. So I've come to also believe that dignity is to design what justice is to law and health is to medicine. In the simplest of terms, it's reflecting back to people that they have value. In my work, I get to do absurd and ridiculous things. And there is um, an inordinate amount of nervousness that comes from that. And I need to be constantly self-aware of where I am and what I'm doing and how I do it, particularly as a privileged white man. So you can imagine how I felt when I was seated at the feet of this incredible woman, only the second woman president in all of Africa, a woman named Joyce Banda, the president of a small country in East Africa called Malawi. Before I was brought to Malawi to brief the president, I probably couldn't have even put Malawi on a map, to be completely honest with you. And yet, as I traveled around the country with aid workers and others, I actually felt like I might have had something to say. It kind of made sense of why I was there. So President Banda was concerned with one of the most dire issues facing Malawi. It was a very high maternal mortality rate, the second worst in the world, second only to Sierra Leone. Here in the United States, we have a maternal mortality rate of about 1 in 2,400. There's about 1 in 36 women die in childbirth. And so women had on their own started organizing near hospitals and clinics. They wanted to get out of their homes and out of their villages, which were often very remote to these hospitals and clinics, and get closer to them. And so they would take over abandoned or incomplete buildings like this one. And so I had a chance to interview dozens of these women across the country. And I had a chance to ask them, well, what did they think of the space that they were in and what could make it better? And this was an important question because President Banda, on her own, before any of us fancy people had showed up to suggest something of the sort, she had said, our country is going to commit to building 150 maternal waiting homes. Beautiful, brand new buildings was her vision. And so that beautiful brand new building was an improvement over this one, and it looks like this. And it was new, and it was big. It could accommodate 36 to 48 women, depending on the actual design configuration. But it was actually built with a lot of local labor, a lot of outside labor, outside contractors. They would bring materials in. There's not very many windows. They're pretty deep windows. There was not great ventilation, not much light at all. There were no amenities like bathrooms, sinks, stoves, anything of the sort. And yet these women never once complained about any of that stuff. They were so excited to have this. So I was at once juggling, well, what do I do? Do I say this is great and just commend and walk away? Or do I say there might be something more possible? And when I got back to the capital city of Malawi, I was seated back there at the president's feet. She was literally on a throne in front of me. Her cabinet was flanking her, international aid leaders, people far more credible than me were surrounding the space. And I commended her on this work, genuinely. But I said, I thought there might be more that they could do. And I pointed her to this hospital, not in Malawi, of course, but in Rwanda, in some other African context, and I flicked through these photos, which were on these, this tiny screen behind me. Everyone was no doubt straining their eyes to see it, and yet I heard audible gasps in the room. From that moment, they had seen a new possible. So when I got back to the States, I encountered a moment that is pretty 
familiar to us, where we leave with a lot of inspiration and good intentions, but we don't know how to act on them. And I could not sleep at night through a mix of jet lag and just determination. And I managed to triangulate an array of partners, including the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, an organization called Mass Design Group, and a US-based uh, medical program with a major uh, presence in Malawi, UNC Medical School. And I said, this is what's at stake. This is what these women are currently in. This is what the government has proposed. And this is, I think, where we might be able to go. And I effectively walked away after making those matches and those relationships. And so I'd love to share with you what this group of people, Mass Design Group, the Ministry of Health in Malawi, these women created together. This is it. So whereas the, the initial inspiration for this were called Maternity Waiting Homes, this is a village. It's called the Maternity Waiting Village. And it's now a prototype for implementation across other parts of Malawi. When the architect for this, one of them, uh, a woman named Patricia Gruitz, came back to the U.S. to give birth as this project entered construction, she found herself in exactly that same kind of room that my wife and I did, in an isolated room, she didn't meet a single other new parent or new baby. And that was exactly our experience. So here is yet another thing that we can hopefully and potentially learn from the Global South. So I really believe that once you see what design can do, you can't unsee it. And once you experience dignity, you can't accept anything less. Both become part of your possible. So for the designers and the creatives in the room, 
I want to just point out that none of the projects in my book, and I of course only showed a few of them, were done on a pro bono basis. And I, I emphasize that because my first book was called The Power of Pro Bono. I was a major and leading advocate for pro bono work, and yet all of these managed to also support and sustain the designers who were contributing their enormous ideas. The second one is that none of them were done by competition. In the same way that logo competitions and everything else never yield good design, that is not how good design is born. I strongly believe that. And the final thing is that all of them, in the same way that you surely do in your practices, turned constraints into opportunities. But I didn't write this book for designers. I write, wrote this book for everyday people to try to raise their expectations. And so here are just three lessons that I hope non-designers take away. One is something that I'm not sure that we've ever said collectively as a design community that you deserve good design. There are so many people in our communities that clearly have never heard that. They're day in and day out told exactly the opposite. The second thing is that you have a right to expect good design. I really strongly believe that design has long been seen as a luxury, but it is a basic human right. And finally, not just you, not just us in this room, everyone deserves good design. And so whatever you can do in whatever walk of life you're in to make sure that people and as many people as possible can benefit from good design, I, for one, commend you and will thank you. And with that, thank you very much. John Kerry. Sure, sit down. Okay. I'm totally cheating because I had to plug my phone in for a little while. Okay. <laughs> the book looks just beautiful. Thank you. Um, could you tell us about a project that didn't make the book? Uh, well, sure. Um, so the, the book was intended to celebrate design that had been completed in the past five years, design that was demonstrably beautiful, and design where I would have access to the clients and the users. And there were really a lot of other projects that I couldn't, couldn't access for one of those reasons. Um, one of the groups that I'm just obsessed with is called TAM Associati, which is a, a Venice-based organization that's kind of like Mass Design Group, the nonprofit design organization that I referenced. And they have partnered for many years now with a, uh, an NGO called Emergency. And I think simply because the client was busy saving the world, quite literally, um, I wasn't able to access that particular client, but that's one that was absolutely like on the, you know, at the finish line, and I simply couldn't get the kind of intelligence that I needed in order to tell that full story. What's the visceral experience of their work? I mean, they talk about beauty and dignity in a way that I wish I could. They talk about bringing it to conflict zones like Iraq, um, work in Afghanistan, um, work really all over these really complicated settings. They've worked in the Sudan, they've worked elsewhere, and you know, you look across a barren landscape and you see this beautiful gleaming building, and inside, most importantly, is world-class healthcare taking place. And Mass, or excuse me, and Tam Associati has gone to great lengths to understand the needs of the organization it's serving, to understand its health workers and its patients. And they might not have made everything perfect the first time around, but they've improved with each subsequent opportunity. Italians. <laughs> well, sure. <laughs> um, ostensibly, the economy is on the rebound right now, and yet we can all think of situations we've been in in which projects were engineered and not designed. Mm -hmm. um, for those of us starting on the ground level, how do you make the case in the room on the front end that design is, is a human right, is not a luxury? Well, I think there are examples where engineering pays off, actually, and there's several examples in the book. Another incredible group based out of Hong Kong working in rural China called Rural Urban Framework, they thrive under those constraints. And I've also seen circumstances where people who truly would not otherwise be able to afford any type of design space have access to it because there was thoughtful value engineering that went into it. So I, I, I think 
it's easy to make it black and white and to paint it as like this is a very bad thing, but I think that it can actually increase access to design. And I'm just as open to those circumstances as I am to you know, super beautiful, unrestricted design. I mean, very often these conversations are cast as who's, gonna, who's the lead on the project? Mm -hmm. Is it a design lead or is it an engineering lead? Mm -hmm. But it, it sounds like what you're talking about is more everybody discussing what the end game is yeah. at, the, at the first part of the process. Well, and I think that in the, first of all, that's, you're very insightful to like acknowledge that. <laughs> Secondly, um, uh, I believe the best projects, certainly in my book, but I think in the world, are ones that are truly integrated and truly collaborative. And there are examples of those. We, of course, only hear and sometimes begru you know, begrudge our clients or others that frustrate us from time to time. But there are projects that do make that case that that type of integration and collaboration is possible. I appreciate your bringing up birthing rooms, but we really have to talk about what happens after the birthing room, after they wheel you from this beautifully designed space after the baby is born into the little room. Are there, are there no other moms in here who know what I'm talking about? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's almost as though... Um, you know, function and process, as if there were, as if there were one, when you think about what you're going to provide for a client, um, it's, it's almost as if there are some obvious access points, like the, a point of entry into a building, or yeah. the first, the, uh, the homepage of a company's website, yeah. or the first thing that's going to come up in your SEO, um, and not, not so much, not so much the entirety of it. Any ideas about, about thinking systemically about not just a facade of an experience, yeah. but all the way through? Well, it's interesting you ask that. Um, we, we left that hospital system that we had referenced um, shortly after the birth of our second daughter, and we entered Kaiser Permanente, which is a system that I have no affiliation with whatsoever. But I have been impressed from a customer service standpoint and an experience design, design standpoint at a level that I've never been impressed with any other you know, major corporation. And they truly have figured this out. It is still entirely imperfect, um, but everything that we've experienced in multiple types of care, ranging from a broken leg to baby checkups to middle of the night emergency rooms, actually have felt dignified. Um, and you know, I, I am very lucky, we're, we're very lucky to have them in California. I believe that. I'm afraid we don't have Atul Gawande with us today to get into My hero. <laughs> why Kaiser is different than some other, yeah. some, other, uh, some other companies and how they think about healthcare experiences. But um, thank you for being here, John Kerry. We really thank appreciate you. it. My pleasure. Thanks so much.